All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Dr. Steph, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine, where I teach financial literacy and transition to practice. I'm also on Instagram and YouTube at Breaking Bad Debt. Today, I'm joined by my co-lecturer, Dr. Mark Soth, who is an ICU doctor that runs the Looney Doctor blog. This is the third of a series of videos to help learners understand the basics of investing, taxation, and incorporation. Today's topic is for those who are incorporated, how to decide between paying yourself salary versus dividends. So Mark, I'll let you take it away. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about salary and dividends uh, from a corporation. And uh, I would point you to the previous video that Steph had uh, done on basics of incorporation. So whether you should incorporate, it goes through some of the tax basics of incorporation. She gives some good examples about income smoothing, which is a great use of a corporation as well as talking about tax deferral and some of the pros and cons of incorporation. And today I'm going to try to talk a little bit about one of the practical issues that people face when they are incorporated, and that's how to pay yourself. So we're going to talk a bit about how money flows through a corporation, paying salary, uh, paying dividends, and then I'll give a bit of a simplified approach to a salary dividend mix. And then there's also a bigger, more nuanced approach that you can take to it. But this is actually something to critically understand because you have to be able to have an educated conversation with your accountant about it. And whether you get the optimal performance out of your corporation is going to depend partly on this mix of salary and dividends. And there's a lot of rules of thumb that are applied. Uh, but the reality is it's actually much more nuanced than that. So uh, if you want to get the best for your situation, you'll have to understand what those nuances are so that you can ask the right questions. And you can also bring the right information to the table for your account because they can't provide you with good advice if they don't know uh, your, how you're planning on spending and your investments because they play into the equation. So again, I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm not a financial professional. I just spend a lot of time reading and learning about this stuff. But really what a corporation is all about is cash flow. And we as small business owners, uh, we have money come into our business, money comes out of our business, and it doesn't do that in a smooth fashion. So you'll have years where you, or even months or weeks where you make a lot of money and then others where you don't make much money. And you'll have uh, years where you spend more and years where you spend less. And the problem with the cash flow fluctuations that we get is our progressive taxation system. So when we get more cash flow and less spend more cash flow and less spending from our business then we actually can the money can overflow the banks of our little river and go into this dry cracked soil which has an endless ability to absorb it and that would be taxes so when you earn more than what what uh, you you earn more than what uh, you need and it's going into that business it overflows you get progressive taxation and you you won't make that up in the down years so the idea of a corporation is to be able to smooth some of that flow so that you don't lose the extra money from those higher years uh, to taxes when you actually need them for those lower income years. It helps to smooth that out. So the way a, business, a corporation really works is to regulate that cash flow. So the business money flows into the big corporate reservoir of money and the corporation acts like a dam where you can open and close the floodgates to let enough money out uh, to meet your personal cash flow needs. And for years where your business makes a bit of extra money, then you can keep more money in that reservoir without paying all of the extra personal tax on it, and then use it in years where you need the money and or you may not have as much business cash flow. So it allows you to get through droughts and to not waste money when you have bumper crop years. So it, it smooths that cash flow. And moving that money out is what we're really talking about today, from business cash flow out to personal cash flow. And that's done by regulating the floodgates. So regulating the floodgates of our corporation is how we pay money out of it. And we have multiple options to do that with. One of them is salary. So that uh, we'll talk a bit about that. That's what most people are probably familiar with. There's also dividends that you can give. And there's two big types of dividends. There's eligible dividends and ineligible dividends. And we'll talk a bit more about that. There are some special type ways that you can move money out that apply to certain situations and they have certain rules that go with them. One would be to give a capital dividend. Uh, if you have capital gains in your corporation and you realize those pay some tax, you can move half of that out tax-free, uh, but you have to have those gains available. Shareholder loans is a way of temporarily moving money out of a corporation that you then have to pay back uh, within 
a time frame, which would be before the end of your next corporate fiscal year. So the most common way people pay themselves uh, when they set themselves up is with salary. And there's a good reason for that. I mean, salary is what we understand. And that's actually important because not only do we understand it, banks and the government and everybody else understands it too. So the way salary works is money gets paid into your corporation from your business uh, profits. You pay out the salary and that salary counts as an expense against the business. So when your dollar money when you're in a dollar in your corporation and you pay a dollar out, well, the next net corporate income is zero. So there's no business tax on the income that you pay out as salary because it gets deducted. Now, because you pay it as salary, you're going to pay personal tax on that to get that into your personal hands. The other nuances that come with it as a small business owner is that in addition to paying the salary, you have to pay the employer part of the Canada Pension Plan or CPP. And so if you have a paycheck that you've been getting, like as a resident or some other employed uh, role that you may have, there's going to see, you'll see CPP deducted from there. And that's the personal CPP that gets deducted. So you play the employee CPP, but you also pay employer CPP. And that's not money that's lost. So one of the things that's often said out, uh, out there is that, well, this is payroll taxes. And if you avoid paying salary, then you avoid paying CPP and that saves you tax. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, a tax really, the way that I would look at it is money that you're paying into a general pot, and then the government decides how to distribute that pot based on politics. Whereas with CPP, it's a pension, which yes, you are forced to pay into it, just like a unionized worker is forced to pay into their pension, but that's, their pension is not a tax, it's their pension. And the amount that you get out of the pension is directly proportional to the amount that you put into that pension. So CPP in my mind, isn't really a tax, it's a pension, and it's one that we're forced to pay into. So it's not money that's lost. Out of curiosity, do you recommend um, individuals maximize their CPP every year? I wouldn't, I wouldn't make CPP my primary objective. It's a side effect of, the, of my salary. Oh. So it forces me to save some money into the pension plan, but it's a relatively small pension plan compared to the amount of money that we're going to have to save as physicians or other high income professionals to uh, provide for ourselves. The big question people would ask, okay, well, is the CPP going to give me a good rate of return? And this is one of the arguments used against CPP is that if I were to take, instead of paying money as salary and paying into CPP, if I were to take that money and invest it in a hundred percent equity portfolio, well, yes, in the long run, I would most likely outperform my CPP. But that's an apple to oranges comparison. I mean, CPP is a safe, low expected return. That's what you expect when something is relatively safe. So a more accurate comparison would be to compare it to bonds, fixed income, or buying an annuity. And I've done a comparison of that on my website with both the employer-employee contributions. And it actually performs pretty well compared to buying an annuity, which would be probably the closest comparator because it's something that's guaranteed and it's indexed to inflation. Uh, and it's pretty comparable to uh, government bonds, which would be a, another relatively safe, low expected return. So the investment return for CPP would be safe and low as you would expect. And if you're putting into CPP, then you could aggress aggressively invest in other parts of your portfolio, knowing that that is there as a bit of a safe floor for you. So it's not something I would seek out necessarily, but I also don't think it's a bad investment. The more important thing is, does salary uh, or dividends make more sense for your financial plan and your taxes? And that's what we're going to talk a bit more, more about next. Now, when you do pay salary, you do pay personal tax on that, which uh, paying out salary, you would have seen that on your, T, your payroll stubs that you get from your employer. The same thing applies. You have to set up a payroll with Revenue Canada, which means you have to get a, a, a payroll number and submit taxes uh, that are due on that income every month. So most of us would pay ourselves salary, pay ourselves once a month, and then usually mid-month, we'd make a remittance of the taxes and CPP that was due on that salary. The best thing you can do is to automate that. So you get that number, you go to your bank, you set up automatic uh, deposits into your account, your personal account for your salary, and automatic remittance to CRA every month for your payroll tax that you have to pay. And if you set that up automatic, then 
you know money is coming into your account, you know money is getting paid to CRA, and you don't want to miss those payments because the penalties for missing those payroll reduction uh, deductions are pretty pretty draconian. Yeah, and you could do that on the CRA website, and it'll automatically remit before the 15th of every month, which is when those payroll taxes are due. Yeah, so you can set it up with CRA. We set ours up with our bank, yeah. uh, with our corporate bank account. So paying salary, there's pros and cons to doing that. One of the pros, I think, is is that it's predictable. So we do all have predictable expenses that come up every month. So you are going to need a certain degree of cash flow. And having that predictably go into your account each month, come out of the corporate account each month and pay your payroll taxes each month makes it very pre predictable that you're not going to have a big surprise tax bill because you got, gave yourself a bunch of money and didn't pay the taxes on it. And you're going to know some, you're going to have some regular cash flow into your personal accounts too. So you're not going to forget things because you don't have stuff coming in automatically. So that's one of the advantages of having a salary uh, is that it's nice and predictable. You can set it up to be automatic. It is also tax efficient. So there's something called tax integration, which is the concept that if you pay yourself uh, directly, just without, just with salary versus paying yourself through a corporation where you pay business tax plus personal tax, that they should equal exactly the same thing. But the reality is that tax integration is not perfect. And if you look, it generally favors salary rather than dividends. So business tax plus dividends uh, ends up being more than if you took salary directly instead. So it is more tax efficient. It's also more relatable. And this is part of why, uh, the tax integration favors salary is the average person understands salary and they're going to be mad if they f hear that, you know, business owners get some kind of tax break by paying themselves dividends. So they understand it. Bankers understand it. So if you want to get a mortgage, it's much easier to get a mortgage using your salary income than showing all the dividends and things that you get from your corporation. So it's relatable and it's also relatable to government too. So for example, when yeah, COVID hit and there were benefits that came out for small businesses. Well, they were all related to salary and it took a little while for them to modify things enough to account for dividends as well. And where salary was to people that paid themselves salary, they had no hiccups right away and they didn't have nearly as many hoops to jump through. So salary, uh, the fact that it's, it's understood by a lot of people and, and means you're an employee of your, even though you're an employee of yourself, uh, I think has some political advantages in terms of your vulnerabilities. When you pay yourself salary, you get RRSP room, which is a registered retirement savings plan. If you eventually want to give yourself open up what's called an independent pension plan, which is uh, like a larger version of an RRSP that a small business can open, uh, you have to have paid yourself salary to be able to do that. So being an employee that gets T4 income is required for both of those tax shelters. And those tax shelters have a lot of advantages. So if you're not paying yourself salary, you're not going to get those advantages. How do you determine what would be a good salary? Are you basing it off of maximizing the RRSP room that you can get? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about it at the end. And the right answer is probably it's it's a dynamic situation. So uh Benjamin Felix and his colleagues at PWL Capital just put out a white paper where they looked at salary, dividends, and independent pension plans in RRSPs. And I found the same thing with my own work that actually what you do is you start out with how much cash flow do you need? And then you can you adjust your way that you pay yourself to meet those cash flow needs. You could pay yourself extra salary uh, if you anticipate that your corporation is going to run into a lot of problems with the small business uh, passive income rules at a very young age. Then by putting more money into your RRSP, uh, you've, you've taken that money and shifted it from your corporation, essentially. So there is a potential uh, to do that. Uh, however, in general, taking out enough salary to cover your costs of living uh, is the best way to do it. In, in, the, in the long run. And when I say that, smoothing is part of that too. So you, if you are saying, you know, I need $80,000 a year right now, so I'm just going to take $80,000 a year, but three years from now, you're going to need $250,000 a year. Well, you're not best off just taking $80,000 and then $250,000 in a couple of years. You're probably better off taking what you need over that three-year period and smoothing it out, taking out, you know, a hundred and something thousand dollars a year. 
instead. So that way you don't bump yourself up into giant tax brackets. Exactly. Especially if you're saving for like a new home that you know might be coming up in five to 10 years, you might increase your salary per year or have a higher salary just so that you can accumulate enough um, enough money instead of just taking out a huge amount all at once and be faced with a bigger tax bill. That's right. And this is exactly the concept of the corporation being really a floodgate regulator. So you want to smooth out that cash flow so that you don't have overflow the banks one year of your river and then the next year you have a drought. Now, salary does have some issues too. I mean, you have to do you have to set up a payroll, which I know people can find intimidating, but it's surprisingly easy. You just get your payroll number from Revenue Canada. Your accountant can help you do that. I mean, when I did it, I didn't have to do anything. My accountant had already done it for me. And then you just set up automatic banking uh, to take your salary out each month and remit the amount that you need to to Revenue Canada. To calculate that, there's a calculator on CRA's website. Or what I just do is I just ask my accountant, you know, I'm giving give myself this much salary each year. How much do I remit each month? And he just tells me and I just put it in and off we go. So it's really not as intimidating as, as you think. And if you want to change it, uh, it's very easy to change too. You just have to change the amount that's going in and out. People will argue about paying into CPP, whether that's a pro or a con. I've already kind of spoken a bit about what the pros and cons of it are. I think if you compare it as an apples to apples to comparison, it's not something to get worked up about. It's not lost tax money. It's just low risk, low expected return investment. Now, the reason why it's often recommended by some accounts to just pay dividends, don't bother paying in salary because it does leave less money in the corporation. You're paying more salary out uh, and salary plus CPP than if you had just paid out just enough dividends and then no CPP, you'd have more money left in the, in the corporation. And that's tax deferred money, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage in the sense that you have more capital to invest, but you're also continuing to grow that tax liability at the same time. And that's what people forget about is that when you leave all that money in the corporation, eventually it can become inefficient and you do have to take that money out and pay taxes at some point. And if your whole notion is to smooth the money flowing out of your corporation while put, letting nothing come out of it and then suddenly having to open the floodgates completely later on doesn't make a lot of sense either. So again, this comes down to predictability. If you have predictable expenses you're going to need to spend money on, salary is probably the best way to do that. Now, of course, it does mean that you have a smaller corporation, but it also means you can have an RRSP, TFSA, other accounts, and it's not all your eggs in that one basket. Exactly. And just for clarification for, for listeners, smaller corp means less corporate bloat, not having too much money into the corp because that can be tax inefficient in the future. That's right. Yeah. It, be, it can become a bit of an issue later on. The other advantage of paying a salary is if you do have a spouse or family member that you want to pay some money to, uh, you can pay them a market rate for the work that they're doing. So that means, you know, for example, if my spouse does $20,000 worth of billing work for my corporation, well, I could pay my spouse a $20,000 salary. And that essentially means that my business makes no tax payments on that. And my spouse would get taxed on that income in, in their lower tax bracket. So it is a way that people can income split uh, using salary. The key there with salary is it has to be a market rate. So if I were to pay an independent third party to do the same job, it would be the same amount of money. I can't just pay them an unlimited amount of money. And that's one of the differences with dividends. So let's talk a little bit about dividends. So dividends, the idea is that you have money come into your corporation, you pay the business tax on it. So that's different from salary where there's no business tax. You pay business tax on that income. The money that's left over is what's called the retained earnings of your corporation. And out of that, you pay dividends to yourself. Now, when you pay those dividends to yourself, you also pay personal tax. And you know the business tax is going to be usually at a low rate. If it's a small business rate, it's going to be somewhere in the range of around 12%. If it's in a large general corporation tax rate, it's going to be around 27%. And then when you pay dividends, if you just look at the personal tax rate, it's lower than it would be for paying yourself salary, but that's because part of that tax has already been paid by the business. And when you add up both the business tax and the personal tax on the dividends, when you add those together, tax integration, the business tax plus the dividend tax is usually more than it would have been if you paid yourself regular income. 
And it's a small amount, like in Ontario at the top tax bracket, it's about 0.5% a year difference favoring salary. At the general corporate tax rate, it gets larger usually around 2%. And of course, that's going to vary by province and it's going to vary by tax bracket, but it's pretty consistent that tax integration favors salary. So dividends have pros and cons too. One of the pros of having dividends is that you can just do them on demand. It's very simple. You want to give yourself a dividend from your corporation while well, you write yourself a check from the corporation to your personal account, or you transfer money from the corporation to your personal account. And you just have to log that when you submit for your taxes with your account each year and in your corporate minute book. One of the other advantages of paying dividends is it releases what's called refundable dividend tax on hand or RDTOH. And what RDTOH is, is a mechanism that's in our tax system to prevent us from having corporations become these giant passive income machines. So what happens when your corporation makes interest or dividends that automatically pays about 50% tax, just a little over 50% tax, to be, which is basically the top personal rate. It's very close to that. And the idea is that you don't get any of that money back until you pay the money out to yourself and then pay the rest of the personal tax. So it's to prevent us from, from keeping a bunch of money in our corporation is that they tax it at the highest personal rate up front. And then it gets a refund when you pay dividends. So paying dividends can release that refundable tax back to your corporation. So the, the income would, if it was interest, would be at around 50% tax. And then when you pay it out to yourself, you pay personal tax on it and the corporation gets about 31% of that back. So it helps to keep that corporation tax efficient by paying out some dividends. Dividends because you're not paying out the full amount of money uh, plus CPP, there's going to be more money left in the corporation and it's going to have more corporate tax deferral as we spoke about kind of on the other end of the scale in the last slide. And the income splitting aspect with dividends is different. So salary has to pay paid at a market rate as if it was being paid to anybody, whereas dividends, it doesn't have to be. So Now on the downside is when you do pay yourself a dividend, you just kind of write yourself that check. You haven't paid the taxes on that yet. So you have to be self-disciplined enough to be planning for that, uh, either by setting aside some money in a savings account or paying down your line of credit to make sure there's room on that and that you're going to be able to hand it, well, handle it when the tax bill comes due. And if you're giving yourself tens of thousands of dollars worth of dividends, be prepared that you're going to have to pay tens of thousands of dollars of tax too. So don't let that surprise you. Uh, paying salary is one of the ways to avoid that. And we've already spoken about tax integration where dividends are a little bit less tax efficient from that standpoint. So how do you put that all together? Well, you can, I, I put that together into what a, a very simplified basic approach to how I would do it. And Stephanie had asked about, you know, how much salary would you pay? Well, again, my start point would be how much after-tax money do I need? And I wouldn't just be considering that for this year, but over the next few years to see whether I should be smoothing that, that drawdown out uh, to try to, to minimize my tax bill. So my next step would be, okay, well, how much dividend do I need to release my refundable dividend on tax on hand? So if I'm paying 50% tax up front, I sure want that money back if I can, right? So I'm going to pay myself enough dividends to release that. For most of us in the early parts of our career, we're not making huge amounts of investment income. So it's probably not a huge amount of dividend required to release that. But as you start to build a larger corporate portfolio, this becomes a more significant amount of money. And then the other thing I would do is pay myself enough salary to meet my needs, make sure I can do, including my RRSP contributions. I, I like to use my TFSA as well. And I think if you have more than about a 10-year time frame, your TFSA is going to end up coming out ahead. So I'd, I'd factor that into how much I need. Now, there's a lot of nuances to that. And this is, this is why I think really when you're doing this, you want to talk to your accountant about it and bring up these issues. And I can tell you, if you don't bring them up, you may not always have them addressed. I have met lots of people who have ginormous refundable dividend tax accounts that have not been released, or they have other notional accounts in the corporation that have taxes been paid and, they, and they're they not getting the refunds. So uh, if you don't ask about it, you may not get it. There are nuances, like if you have a low income spouse, salary, paying some extra salary to them, whether you need the money or not could be useful because you could pay them that extra salary. And if you don't need it for living, they could take that income that they've earned and invested in their own name. And then they start to grow a very, very tax efficient uh, account in their own name. 
So even though it's, it's subjected to tax, and if it's subjected to tax at a very low tax rate, that's more efficient than a corporation or just about anything else other than the TFSA or RSP. So paying some extra salary, even when you don't need it, sometimes makes sense if it's to a lower income spouse. Same thing with dividend income splitting. If you have the option to do that, sometimes splitting out some extra dividends to a lower income spouse to again, allow them to build up their own personal account at a low tax rate over time can be a, a good long-term strategy. And these aren't strategies that people that are thinking one or two years of taxes at a time think about. This is why for you as the person who has to kind of bridge between a long-term planner and your accountant who may be thinking one or two years at a time, it's important to understand these things. You have a bunch of other notional accounts in your corporation too. One of those is the capital dividend account or CDA, which your corporation gets from realizing capital gains. So if your corporation has an investment, it does well, you sell that, you pay a little bit of tax on it, but then you get half of that goes into your capital dividend account, which you can then give yourself a tax-free dividend from it. And then there's general rate income pool or GRIP, which your corporation gets uh, when it's paid somewhere along the line taxes at the, at the higher general corporate rate, which is around 27%. And what GRIP does is it allows you to pay yourself eligible dividends instead of ineligible ones. And because of tax integration, the amount of personal tax you take pay on eligible dividends is lower than ineligible ones because the idea is that when you add up the general tax rate for the corporation and the lower tax rate for the eligible dividend, that that's going to be close to what you would have gotten if you just earned the income. Whereas if it's a small, small business tax rate, which is really low, you're going to have to pay ineligible dividend tax on the dividend, which is going to be higher because when you add the two together, it all comes out to be pretty close to the same thing. I wasn't sure but, if you touched on this earlier, but did you mm -hmm. talk about the difference between what's an eligible versus ineligible dividend? Yeah, I didn't, which which was why I figured I better come back to that. So an eligible dividend is something that you're able to pay yourself because your corporation has this GRIP account. So what's happened is that your corporation has either gotten an eligible dividend from its investments, which means that whichever company gave that dividend paid tax at the high corporate tax rate, which is around 27%. So if I had, a, for example, stocks in a bank, well, that bank's paid 27% tax. They give an eligible dividend to my corporation. I'm allowed to actually flow that through to myself. And I would only pay, you know, the top rate in Ontario is around 39% and compared to 54%. And the reason why it's 39% compared to 54% is because some of that tax has been paid by the, the corporation already when you add them together. And you, the other way that you get that ability to pay out eligible dividends is if your corporation is paying taxes at that higher tax rate itself. So if I have a corporation that after salaries and all my overhead and everything else is paying, which is, is pay is earning more than about $500,000 a year, uh, then that extra money that's above that $500,000 a year is taxed at, a, at that higher tax rate but I'm allowed to give myself some eligible dividends instead. So this is all part of the tax integration system, which is basically a way of making it all work out to be very close uh, without having any advantages for corporations. Uh, so that if you do, if you've paid those taxes, you have these notional accounts and which means if you have those, then, you know, you might want to empty them out so that you can at least get the benefit side of the equation since you've already paid the tax. The other way you could, you, that you may want to consider your, your mix is if you're getting into trouble with the passive income limits. So I'd said that paying yourself salary is a, is a dollar for dollar expense to your corporation. So if my corporation is getting bumped over those passive income limits, which are a combination of your corporation's active income and its passive income, well, I can lower the active income part of that by making a, a higher expense in my corporation by paying myself more salary. And the reason why I put all of these nuances is because I want you to understand what they are so you can have these discussions with your accountant. Now, the optimal mix using that general strategy is going to change over your lifetime. So when you're starting out your career, you're likely to be paying yourself mostly in salary because you're not going to have a lot of investment income to need to give yourself dividends, right? Because it's uh, you don't uh, need to release that refundable tax. So you're going to pay yourself a lot of salary, build up RSP room, get those RSPs cooking. As you start to build a larger corporation, your corporation is going to be making more investment income and you're going to need to pay more dividends to release that investment income. And of course, there's going to be little bumps that happen along the way. You may decide to give yourself a bonus one year because you either want to 
buy something or pay for something, or you have some passive income limit issue, you may have another year where you give yourself a capital dividend because you've realized some capital gains in your corporation and you want to pass out that money tax efficiently to yourself to either invest personally or to spend on something. So that basic approach has lots of complicated nuances to it. So what I have done is I've made a, a calculator, which I, I think is a bit of an accountant conversation starter. Uh, it's the corporation to personal salary and dividend optimizer. So what you do on my website, uh, you can find this calculator in the financial calculator section and you enter in what your spending goal is. And you enter in how much you want to put in your RSP and your TFSA, how much your corporation made, and then it'll do, do the taxes and work backwards and tell you how much salary and dividends uh, would be the optimal mix to kind of release all of those taxes, including it accounts for a lot of these nuances that I talked about. So just to summarize, a corporation helps us regulate cash flow, which is important to keep our taxes smooth. Uh, one way to pay ourselves out of that, that corporate reservoir is using salary, which we have to set up payroll for. We make regular payments, taxes, remittance, and CPP contributions, but you also get RRSP or potentially if you decide to do it later, IPP room. It, tax integration generally favors salary. Dividends, on, on the other hand, are very easy to set up. You just kind of give them to yourself, but you also have to plan for the taxes that you owe on them. You don't generate RSP room by giving yourself dividends, but because you're, you're not paying as much out of the corp, you're leaving more in the corporation, which allows you to have that corporate tax deferral. Dividends also re-release that refundable dividend tax on hand, which is, becomes important as you start to have more investment income in your corporation. And for all of those reasons, the optimal mix is probably going to change over your life. So probably be a lot of salary to begin with. And then as you have more and more corporate investments, have some more dividends into the mix. Great. Thank you, Mark, for the informative mm -hmm. talk today. And be sure to check out some of these resources. And next time, we'll do another video together. If there's any great ideas that you want us to cover, please leave them in the comments below. Or if you have any questions, leave them there as well. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to like and subscribe.